Okay, if you're still with us, we're gonna get into the basic assumptions of statistical tests. And this is a really, really important concept in this class because my understanding when I first taught this class is that most students that take statistics classes aren't actually introduced to the concept of basic assumptions until they get into this class. So if you're one of the few folks that understands what basic assumptions are, congratulations to you. But for others, I assume this may be the first time you're hearing about basic assumptions now. So all the tests that we're gonna perform this term, they all only work if there are certain conditions that are met, right? So there needs to be boundaries, right? So when you talk about boundaries, you might talk about, for example, boundaries within families, boundaries within relationships. And so, for example, if you have, let's say, um, if, if, if you're, you know, uh, an 18 to 22 year old in the class, you might have boundary issues being someone that's new coming off to college for the first time. And mom and dad might call you more than you might otherwise like while you're trying to build your independence. And if you're someone who's outside of that range and who maybe are parents yourselves, you uh, may have boundaries with certain family members and friends that you need to create criteria in which this relationship can function in a way that's positive and that's good for you. But if certain things are violated or people act outside of those norms of what is mutually agreeable, then you can't engage with that person, right? For example. So the same principle works with statistical analyses. Every procedure that we perform this term is going to have boundaries or what we call basic assumptions. And basic assumptions are a series of conditions that must be met in order for these tests to work in the way that they were designed to work. And if we have violations to those assessments, then we could possibly throw the entire analysis into question and have to come up with a different way of answering that question, which is of course not ideal. So assumptions are conditions that need to be met in order for the data to show what it intends to show. And there are four major, what we call parametric basic assumptions. And they are additivity and linearity, normality, homogeneity of the variance, and independence. So additivity and linearity occurs when we have an outcome variable, dependent variable, should be correlated with its predictors. So basically, if a variable is correlational in nature, and we're going to go through some of the procedures that involve correlation and regression later on in the term, but the input should be related to the output. If they don't relate, then how can we make any type of determination based off of that? You can't. So the test doesn't work in the way it's supposed to work. The second one, which is probably the most important out of the four, is what's called normality or a normal distribution. So if we have a continuous variable or a dependent variable or an effect variable, we assume that that dependent variable is gonna fall along a normal bell-shaped curve that is symmetrical right down the middle. So the area on the left side of the curve is equal to the area on the right side of the curve in that um, the curve is asymptotic, it's continuous, and it's symmetrical. That's a very important basic assumption that we have to have in parametric statistics. The third variable is what's called homogeneity of the variance, which says that if I have different groups of data or different time points of data, that the variability, the average amount of variance around a typical score should be about the same in both groups, right? I don't wanna have a lot of variability in one group, my experimental group, and little to no variability in my other group because I can't really make any comparisons if I got a lot of variability in one group and no variability in another. To really make it a fair comparison, I need the same amount of variability between both the experimental average in, in, in dispersion and the control groups mean or average in dispersion, right? So then it's a fair, it's an apples to apples comparison. But if I have too much variability in one group or one condition and not enough in another, I can't really make any definitive conclusions about what's going on with those data because the variance is thrown off. So homogeneity is really, really important. 
And then lastly is the assumption of independence, which says that if there are errors in the data, they shouldn't be related to each other because of something else that happened in them. So here is a perfect example of what the normal distribution looks like. You've probably seen this before in other courses, but in this particular case, you've got a bell-shaped curve and the mean, the median, and mode of that bell-shaped curve is gonna be zero. And so when you look at this curve and we split the curve down this red line here, you can see that the area on the right side of the curve is about the same as the area on the left side of the curve. That's what makes it symmetrical. You'll also notice that when you look at the scores going from left to right, that the line itself doesn't actually touch this baseline. So it floats. That's what we call asymptotic, meaning it does not touch the baseline. It's also continuous, meaning that these are often from negative infinity numbers to positive infinity numbers, often interval levels of measurement, often dependent variables or effect size variables, um, but not always. And so a normal distribution is bell-shaped, it's symmetrical, it's asymptotic, and it's continuous, as you can see here. And so if this assumption is violated, then this basically means that um, you don't have symmetry in your data, which represents variability of scores across a distribution, and our ability to interpret those data might be held into question sometimes. We'll get into some of the specific tidbits of those throughout the term, but normality is really important. Some other ways that we can measure and verify whether normality has been present, you can do it graphically with the histogram as you see right here on the slide. We can do it with what's called a PP plot or a QQ plot, which basically looks at all these little, this, these little black circles here, how tight they are to this uh, 45 degree line going through. So if you saw a lot of circles out here, that would mean that there's a lot more variability and it's not really uniform in nature. So a good normal distribution is gonna be pretty tight to that line. You could run something that's known as a normality test, such as the KS test or the Shapiro-Wilkes test, which tells us whether or not the distribution is statistically the same or if it's statistically different from a perfectly normal distribution. So in either one of these cases, if you looked at height, for example, the significance value is smaller than 0.05, which tells us that in both cases, um, that the, the, the normal distribution assumption has been violated for the KS test, but has been met for the Shapiro-Wilkes test. Okay, So it's been violated for the KS test, but it's been met for the Shapiro-Wilkes test. So that's a way we can do this as well. A third thing that we can then do is we can do what's called a skewness and a kurtosis statistics test. So in this particular case, what you do is SPSS and JASP will provide us with what's called a skewness statistic. So if we look here, you can see the statistics column. And if you come down, you can see where it says the skewness value, 0.230. We also notice that we're provided a standard error for that skewness of 0 0.121. Well, if you ran a skewness and a kurtosis statistic, you would take the 0 0.230 and divide it by the 0 0.121 to get your skewness statistic. You'd perform the exact same functions for the kurtosis and the kurtosis standard error. And if those numbers, either one of them, are above or below 1.96 on an absolute value, that would tell you that you have violated the assumption of skewness and kurtosis. More on this in additional lecture video. Okay, we also talked about assessing the basic assumption of homogeneity of the variance. And similar to the assumption of normality, we can do this with graphs or we can do this statistically. I would tell you that in the first half of the course, we're gonna be using it through statistical tests. But in the second half of the course, when we get to correlation and regression, we're gonna focus more on um, the graphical methods, okay? So if we were to look here, the Levine's test for equality of group variances basically is a test that tells us when we have two different groups of data, if the variability or the dispersion of one group is similar to the variability or the dispersion of another group. 
And in this particular situation, if we truly have no difference in variance between the two groups, then we have met the basic assumption of Levine's test for equality of group variances. However, if we have a lot of variance in one group and not very, very much in another group, we have violated that basic assumption of homogeneity of the variance, and that's indicative by a statistically significant Levine's test. So we wanna make sure that um, our data is similar in terms of its variability, because that's a really important component of comparing our data on an apples to apples comparison uh, in order to do that. Graphically, you can see that there's a couple of examples with line graphs and with scatter plots here. And in a normal distribution, you'll notice this kind of looks like a normal bell-shaped curve. If I was to flip this picture on its side, this would kind of look like a bell-shaped curve. But in a nonlinear or a heteroscedastic distribution, you can see that they are not clustering those data points in that way. I don't expect you to know this in great detail at this point of the term, but just trust me that as we progress and move along throughout the term, you'll have all this and more to help you understand when it's appropriate to really understand how to pull these graphs apart. So the last thing that we need to think about before we end this lecture series is this concept of what's known as outliers. And so an outlier occurs when we have a particular data point in our data set that is just different from all of the other data points that exist. And so in this particular case, when you have outliers present in your data, it could throw off the entire data analysis in a way that really makes our ability to make inferences about the statistics from a sample about a larger population that we're trying to infer about really be put into question. So when we have outliers in our data, they can absolutely bias the, the results that we learn from the statistic and how we infer information about the larger population from them. In an example that really makes a lot of sense, I put two graphs on this slide. You can see from the scatter plot and the red circle that that particular data point does not at all belong in this data set compared to all of the other several data points that you see in blue dots on the slide. It's way up there by itself, which tells us it's an outlying value. As a consequence of that, it's likely throwing off the rest of the data in the data set. Similarly, in a box plot, you see those two little asterisk values that are circulated with the red circle. And in this particular case, again, you have data that is largely thrown off from the typical data in a distribution, which again could throw off and put all of our analyses into question. So whenever you do a scatter plot and you see a number on an island by itself, and whenever you have a box plot and you see asterisks, those are being flagged as ways to tell you as a researcher that you have an outlier in your data set and you need to determine whether or not you want to keep that outlier or if you want to remove it. Okay. So I hope this video is helpful. In the next video, we're going to go ahead and talk a little bit about how you know what statistical procedure to choose to answer your research question.